yeah, the way I look at it, you know, this is just my opinion. Trophies and medals are good to have when you achieve something, but there's more to be in it being a champion than winning in my opinion. If you leave a good impact on as many people as you can, you're a champion in my opinion. Well, yeah, it's a good way to look at it, you know, and, and um, you know, and that's, that's the thing at the end of the day, I'd, I'd like to leave a positive impact on the sport. Um, you know, and I think it's, it's, it's something that didn't really occur to me at the beginning of my career. It was more of just, I was happy to be you know, able to make a living as a professional driver. And, and you know, the, the longer you're in here, the more you, you know, and, and the closer you get to the end of your career, I think the more you start looking at things and go, you know, I, I'd like to leave, you know, a positive legacy. I'd like to be out there. And hopefully when, when people look back at, at the career I had, they can say, yeah, you know, the, the Holland guy is a really good driver and, and look at all, all the good things he did for the sport. Um, so, yeah, so I, I'd really like to be able to see that uh, that, that be my legacy. Yeah. What's your best memory in the sport so far? Oh, uh, well, I've been in the sport for 20 years. I got a few of them. So, <laughs> um, from, from a pure sporting perspective, um, I would say the 24 hours of Nürburgring in, I think it was 2015 or 2014. And um, we had assembled a really, really good lineup when we were running the the, the factory backed uh, Audi TTRS, and it was a really, really quick car. And uh, we had been really competitive with it in, in uh, a bunch of the Nurburgring Endurance Series races. We had gotten into the you know the 24 hour race, and uh, we had an engine problem, and uh, so we didn't qualify particularly well. And then on race day, for whatever reason, I'd been feeling great up, right up until race day morning, and I woke up in the morning and, and ended up with a 102 degree fever. I mean, it was just absolutely brutal. And I was due to start in the car. And uh, I was like, all right, you know, I'm gonna get in and do this as, as long a stint as I can, but uh, you know, I'm not, not feeling 100%. And, and uh, so we'll just have to kind of wait and see. So we started P5. By the time we got to the end of the, the, G, the Grand Prix circuit, uh, I made my way into P1 and I led the field uh, onto the north side, onto the, to the north loop. And there was 300,000 spectators all lining the fence. And I spent the entire lap out front of the whole entire field. And uh, I, that to me, I, was, I remember sitting in the car, and as sick as I was, I just, I just remember going, I, I have to remember this. Like, I have to absorb all of this energy because this, there, there will never, ever, ever be a feeling like that again. It was, it was really cool. It was really special. So that's the, the one real good memory I take away. That's amazing. I dabbled into some go-karts years ago when I was an early teen. Do you want to hear my best memory and when I raced? Absolutely. It was a lot of fun. I, I was one of the very few people that had a perfect race, if you know what I mean. Yeah. It was 100% perfect because I got into the go-kart, led the fastest lap, qualified on pole, and then I just ran away from the whole field during the entire event, which I think was 100 or 200 laps long or something. Somewhere in there. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Oh, wait, it was 200. Yeah, it was 200 laps, and I just, it was around a road course, and I, I just flat out spanked everyone and led every single lap and won the race. That's awesome. I won the race, but not without a final lap. Not without a final lap battle because... Uh, with 10 laps to go, someone that was running second place at the time, I started having like a rattling problem with the go-kart, and so it wasn't steering right, and I was losing a few seconds a lap, and he caught up to me right in the final turn and was going to pass me for the win, and we went down the front stretch, and I beat him by like a bumper. Oh, nice. Good job. Yeah, I remember. I just remember being not knowing who won, and then seconds later, I was told that it was a photo finish, and I edged the guy. And so I won the pole, led every single lap, and won the race, and ran the fastest lap. Nice, that is awesome. Congrats. That's that's a great memory to have. Yeah, yeah. Have you had races like that? Uh, I think good races. Obviously, Nashville's were a couple of them where you know, we just kind of came in and dominated the weekend. You know, that was that was a really cool thing. You know, to be able to come in and, and um, you know, same same type of deal. Actually, it was you know we we were fastest in FP one, fastest in FP two, 
uh, well qualified, he got rained out, but uh, but you know I was that, that man I was on pole and then led every lap in both races and set fastest lap in both races and you know and especially in race one it was it was great because um, you know it was just a, it was you know once again it was a night race and so it was really it was kind of cool that's you know great energy and stuff but uh, basically just checked out uh, it was about a second a lap quicker than everybody else so by the end of the race. Um, I think I was, uh, I think it was the better part of like 15 seconds up on the rest of the field. So to, to be that dominant is always a really good feeling. It's just, you know, it's, it's, there's no pressure from behind and you can really just enjoy like, you know, what you're doing and, and enjoy being in the car, and, you know, enjoy the energy from the fans and, and, and all of that. So just a, just, that was just a, you know, great, great experience. And, and uh, yeah, th- things, times like that are rare. I think the, the longer you race, the, the more you have to recognize how rare those things are and, and just appreciate them for, for what they are. Yeah. I wish they would bring back the Denver Grand Prix that used to be run by Centrix, I believe. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I love that race. And it was obviously great for me because, you know, from the, from the standpoint of, of uh, sponsorship and stuff, I, I, you know, I was the, I was the, the hometown kid. So I, you know, I got a lot of, a lot of uh, publicity out of it. A lot of people that were, you know, were, were, were a lot of sponsorship out of it, which was awesome. And that, that was a good, good crowd too. We, we had a, we had a fairly decent run there. Um, you know, when we did it, but uh, I think I'd love to go back now with the with the knowledge and the experience that I've had. That I think I could I could do really well here. And anytime you get to, to, to compete in front of your you know your friends and your family, I think is, is pretty awesome. So um, yeah, I think it'd be one one big party if they brought the Denver Grand Prix back. I'd, I'd have more than a few friends out wanting to wanting to come and watch the race and, and celebrate. If they ever do that, I'd certainly be up there for sure, knowing my Colorado roots. Yeah, we'd love to have you up here. It'd be it'd be a lot of good fun. Didn't it didn't it go out of business because of the fall of Centrix, or was it because you know they couldn't allow the streets to be used anymore? No, it was actually it was a combination. Centrix definitely was a was a big one. That was that was a really tough hit. Um, but the, um, the 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 bigger thing was is uh, it coincided with the Democratic National Convention that was held at the Pepsi Center. And that was held, I think it was going to be a couple weeks before, a couple weeks after the race, I don't remember what, but uh, what they, could, they couldn't they could get the race torn down in time before they needed the streets clear for uh, for the convention. So it was the that combination of that that, that made it, um, un- unfortunately, the, the demise of the Grand Prix. Oh, dang. Yeah, so it was, a, it was a bit of a bummer, but it's the same kind of thing as Nashville where... You know, it's at the end of the day, it's just really tough because, um, you know, it, it's it, it's it's a very expensive thing to put on a street course uh, event. I mean, the all of the, the road closures you have to do and the barriers you have to bring in and everything that you have to set up, it's it's really quite difficult. So it's a lot more expensive to do a street course event than, than to go to a, a permanent built uh, facility. So, um, yeah, so I, you know, most of the street course races that I know have a very, very short lifespan. Um, the only the only three I know of that are are, are long lived are, are obviously the Long Beach Grand Prix, which has been around for forever. You know, it started off as a as an F1 race, and then um, you know the St. Petersburg Grand Prix, which has been around for quite some time, and then uh, Macau, which has been around for forever. So um, those are the three that have longevity. But other than that, I think it's just um, you know you're looking at you know them being around for three or four years before they before they just, it just you know the, the economics of it don't quite work out anymore. Yeah, I knew from the very beginning entering the track, entering the streets of Nashville that it was going to be a big weekend because I had, within only 10 minutes of entering the the first day of the event, I had probably as high of an, of an event, or no, I had probably the moment of a race fan's dream literally within the first 10 minutes. You want to hear what happened? Sure. I entered the track with my friend that went with me to the race. She didn't know much about racing, and so I was talking with her as we entered the track, telling her about the big names in IndyCar like Unser and Andretti, and, and, you know, also, I think there, I also told her about other drivers like Rick Mears and Emerson Fittipaldi, all those big names, you know. And, and what happened was as we entered the track, we were chatting so much to the point where we were forgetting that there were people around us. 
walking and so we we decided to stand in a field and just talk there and it was an empty field and I was just about to get coincidentally telling her the story about how Sam Hornish Jr. and Penske how they nipped Marco Andretti at the finish line at Indy in 2006 you know that race right I do and I was telling her about it and I suddenly found myself on the ground at that moment having been hit by a golf cart and I stood up and it was Roger Penske's golf cart with him behind the wheel. <laughs> hey, anytime you get hit by Roger Penske, that's not a bad day. It's not a bad day. I, I mean, at the moment I was thinking, okay, what idiot just hit me, you know? And then I stood up and my attitude changed when I saw who it was, you know? <laughs> I, because you know when you're when you're when you grow up a race fan like me and you get hit by Penske, it's like an honor. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, absolutely. It wasn't just that though that got me really, that got me so excited. It was just what I thought about afterwards. Because obviously I asked for a picture and he gave one to me. He was friendly enough to do that, obviously, and to check on me to make nice. sure I was okay. But of course. But I thought it was really funny as well that I was talking about Penske's driver beating Marco Andretti, and then a split <laughs> minute later it was Penske running into me. <laughs> it was just a funny coincidence. Oh, funny. A funny coincidence, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, that, that is the cool thing about street circuits because everything is so condensed and everybody's kind of around that you, you, uh, you literally run into people like Roger Penske. Yeah, he's very fan friendly. I've seen a lot of pictures from other people that have met him over the years, and he's very fan friendly. And I think he was actually the best guy to take over the IndyCar series, in my opinion. <laughs> 